Hello students, today we're going to talk about inverse functions and their derivatives, which in our textbook is section 7.1. So we're going to again review inverse functions. And then we're going to also talk about their derivatives. Okay, so first thing we need to talk about before we jump into inverse functions are one-to-one -one functions. Now we usually have a shorthand notation for one-to-one, -one, which is just a one-dash-one -one in parentheses, and that's pretty common to see that even in your textbooks. Now to be a one-to-one -one function, you must begin with a function and then have that function also pass a horizontal line test. So it's a function that passes the horizontal line test. Now if it's already a function, it is already passed to the vertical line test, but for it to be a one-to-one -one function, it must also pass the horizontal line test. So for example, if we have a function something similar to the square root of x, which looks like this, then this does pass the horizontal line test, meaning if I strike a horizontal line anywhere and it only intersects that given graph one time, then it does pass the horizontal line test, and so yes, it is one to one. Well, let's take, for instance, something like a parabola, something we do very frequently. Now this one, if I try to check the horizontal line test, you can see it will cross it or it will intersect the graph more than once. So this one is not one to one. Well, we use an awful lot of these x squared squaring functions, and so, let me see if I can clean this up a little. So we're going to need to figure out a way to make them one to one. So what you will see happen a lot in our textbook and with the examples that we will be doing, I don't know why my line got so fine real suddenly, is that we will have a graph of a parabola, but they will only give us maybe half of it. So this is the graph of y equaling x squared, but they're limiting it. Goodness, I'm making a mess here. Hang on just a second. Try again. Okay, but they take this graph of f of x equaling x squared and they limit the domain by saying that x is less than or equal to zero. So that only gives me half of the parabola, which is then one to one. Okay, so if they give me the full parabola, the full x squared function, it is not one to one. But if we limit the domain to only half of the graph, then it would be one to one because it would pass the horizontal line test. Okay, once we come up with a function that is one-to-one -one by passing the horizontal line test, then we can talk about inverse functions. Now when we have an inverse function, it does have a unique notation. This is not an exponent of negative one, but when you put a negative one above your f for your function, that indicates the inverse. So the first thing we need to know about inverse functions is that a function must be one-to-one -one before it can have an inverse. So a function must be one-to-one -to, -one to have an inverse. So your function must pass the horizontal line test in order for it to have an inverse. Now once you've come up with the inverse of a function, you can check to make sure it's an inverse of the function by doing the composition. So the composition Okay, the composition of a function and its inverse must equal x. Okay, the composition of a function and its inverse must equal x. So when we talk about composition, this is the old stuff that you may have referred to as fog and golf where you have the open circle between the two functions. And so what this is saying is that f composition f inverse of x must equal 
must equal x algebraically, and also the, the change in the direction of the composition, the inverse function composition to the original, must also equal x. So algebraically, the composition both directions must come out to equal x. So let me do an example. Suppose we're given that f of x, your original function, equals x cubed minus 1. And then suppose they give me a g of x function, which is going to be the cube root of x plus 1. And the question is, are they inverses of one another? Well, for them to be inverses of one another, when I do the composition, it would have to algebraically equal x. So f composition g of x would be f of g of x which would be f of the cube root of x plus 1. Well, this turns out to be, go to the f function and replace the x, replace this information that's cubed with that cube root of x plus 1. Well, the cube root of x plus 1 cubed is x plus 1, and so this does equal x. So first check, we have half of the proof done. Now we have to reverse the composition and do g composition f of x. Okay, well that's g of f of x, which is g of f of x is x cubed minus 1. So now I go to my g function, and in place of the x, I'm going to put the x cubed minus 1. So this becomes the cube root of x cubed minus 1 plus 1, which is... the cube root of just x cubed, which equals x. So since the composition in both directions algebraically equals x, we can therefore say, therefore, we can say that g of x is the inverse of f of x. So g of x up here now can be renamed f inverse of x. So we know that these two functions are inverses of each other. Okay, so now we understand how to do that. So now we know how to write it. We know how to prove it. So number one and number two must be one to one to have an inverse. The composition must equal x. And now number three is going to be how to find the inverse. So let me come down to another page, number three how to find the inverse. So we're going to be given a function, we're going to determine if it's one to one, and then if it is, we're going to actually come up with the inverse function. And then we're also going to go ahead and compare the graphs because there's something very significant in the graphs of a function and its inverse. Okay, so suppose we're given the function We'll call this example A. Suppose we're given the function f of x and it equals 4x minus 7. Well, that's a linear graph, always increasing, so it will be 1 to 1. So, it, so I'm going to confirm. I know it's a linear graph. I know it's 1 to 1. So since it's 1 to 1, I need to find the inverse. Well, to, before I find the inverse, I'm going to first rewrite the function just as an equation instead of as an inverse instead of in function notation, because that makes it a little bit easier. And I'm also going to go ahead and take a look at a few ordered pairs and get it graphed. So if x is 0, y will be negative 1. If x is 1, 4 times 1 is 4, minus 7, which is a negative 3. If x is 2, 4 times 2 is 8, minus 7 is 1. So I can get <clears throat> a graph. Okay, so 0, negative 7, I might have to go by 2's here, 2, 4, 6, 8, so 0, negative 7 would be right here, 1, 1, 2, 1, negative 3, and 2, 1. So we're going to go by 2's. Okay, it's really hard to get a straight line with this pen, but there is the graph of f of x. Not really clean, but close enough. Okay. So there, there's my inverse function, or there's my original function graphed. Now to find the inverse function, I'm going to put a little bit of a bridge between these two. To find the inverse function, all I need to do is reverse the variables in this equation. 
So where it says y equals 4x minus 7, I'm going to rewrite it as x equaling 4y minus 7. So I switch out the x and y variables. Now what I have to do is solve this new equation, which is my inverse function. Solve it for y. So if I add 7 to each side of the equation, and then I divide every term by 4, I get this new function, which is my inverse function, which is x fourths plus 7 fourths. That is my inverse function. So I can even put it up here in the title. It is x fourths plus 7 fourths. Now what's really unique about an inverse function, we have it written, is if you look at the table of values on the left side, okay, if you look at this table of values, and you think about a table of values for your inverse function, notice that if you put a y value in from the original function, you replace x with it, negative 7 fourths plus 7 fourths would be 0. If I let x be negative 3, negative 3 fourths plus 7 fourths is 4 fourths, which is 1. And if I let x be 1, 1 fourth plus 7 fourths is 8 fourths, which is 2. So take a look at the two tables the inverse table and the table of ordered pairs for the original function, the x and y variables, and I'll just put a, b, are completely switched. Is what, and that is exactly what an inverse function does, is it reverses the x, y variables, and it reverses the x, y ordered pairs. So now if you graph these, and I'm going to try to do a different color with the graph. Uh, maybe I will go with, with um, green. Okay, if I do negative 7, 0, 2, 4, 6, negative 7, 0, negative 3, 1, 2, negative 3, 1, and if I do 1, 2, 1, 2, and I graph it, and again I'm not using a straight edge, I'm just getting a rough graph here, you can see your inverse function in green. Now when you look at these two graphs, what is unique about this is that if I am to graph if I cut quadrants 1 and quadrant 3 in half with a dashed line here, you will notice that the function and its inverse are reflections over that line, and that line's name is y equaling x. So a function and its inverse are reflections over the line y equaling x. So three things are happening here. You have your equation. You find you have your, your original equation in the inverse, you, re, you flip the x and y variables. In the table of their original function, the inverse is to flip their original ordered pairs. And in the graph, the two functions are reflections over the line y equaling x. Now another interesting thing is if we, well let's just go to another example. This one's not really good to come up with the next nice comparison between these two. So let's do another example where we can make a few more comparisons. Let's have a quadratic function. Let's start off with f of x being x squared plus 4. Now we know what x squared looks but plus 4 looks like. It's our parabola u-shape up 4 units. So if I were to graph it, two, four, it would look something like this. Well, that is not one-to-one. -one. That does not pass the horizontal line test. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to restrict the x values to be less than or equal to zero. So that erases the left half of my graph. And now there's a filled circle here, and that will be one-to-one. -one. So now that it is one-to-one, -one, I can find the inverse. An inverse should exist. Now before I go through this, I'm going to start off and I'm going to notate a few other things here. The domain of this is negative infinity to an x value of 0. The range of this original function is at a height of 4 up to positive infinity. Okay, so this is the ordered pair 0, 4. Your domain is your x values, left to right, negative infinity to 0, and your range is the y value, 4 to positive infinity. Now let's just look at a few ordered pairs that we can use. Suppose we let x be 0, then we know the y value is 4. Suppose we let x be negative 2, 
then negative 2 squared is positive 4 plus 4 is 8. And suppose we let x be a positive 2. Well, hang on, let's take the back. Let it be a negative 3. Change that a little bit. Sorry, got a little distracted. Let this be a negative 3. Then a negative 3 squared is 9 plus 4 is going to be 13. So I just have a rough graph, but here's some ordered pairs where that really should be going through those points. Okay, so now on the right side, I'm going to come up with the inverse. Okay, so to get the equation of the inverse, my original function, it works out easiest if I go ahead and write my original function as an equation using the y variable. So over here now, this would say x equaling y squared plus 4. That is my inverse function, but I need to solve it for y. So I'm going to subtract 4 from each side of this equation. And then to solve for y, I need to take the square root. But really, I need to be sure I put the plus minus in front of my radical. So this is y equaling plus minus the square root of x minus 4. Well, what this looks like, and I guess I will change it back to the green again. This, if you graph it, is to the right 4 units, and the radical will look like this, that is the plus minus version of x minus 4. Well, I cannot have the plus and the minus on this because otherwise it wouldn't be a reflection of the original quadratic equation. So for it to be a reflection over that line y equaling x, I can only have the bottom half. So the bottom half is not the plus minus, but it is strictly the negative of the radical. That's your inverse function. So I need to come in here and erase the top half in order to be sure I get that correct. So this is the inverse function with the minus sign. Now, the other interesting aspects here, as we learned from the last example, is the inverse function's ordered pairs will be the same as the original, but flip them. So instead of 0, 4, it's 4, 0, which we notice is original point. Instead of negative 2, 8, it would be 8, negative 2 and then 13, negative 3, which is really off of my chart. But these points would lie on my inverse function. The other thing that I really wanted to show you with this example was you can notice that I pulled in the domain and range of the original function. Well, looking at this inverse function, the domain of this graph starts with an x value of 4 and goes to infinity. The range of the inverse function starts with a y value. Hold on. The range is a low value of a negative infinity and a high value of 0. So now compare the domain and range of the original function to the domain and range of the inverse. Let's look at this. The domain of f of x turns out to equal the range of the inverse. And the range of f of x turns out to equal the domain of the inverse. So again, in summary, of the two functions, the equation, those are my dogs, <laughs> the equations x squared was y to x squared plus 4 now goes to x equaling y squared plus 4 by flipping the x and y variable. Hold on. Okay, so let me go back now that I've tried to calm my two Yorkies and my cat just walked through my room. Okay, so your original function y equals x squared plus 4. The flip of it over here is x equals y, x equals y squared plus 4. Solve it for y. The, the table, all the values in the table get flipped for the inverse function to be graphed. And the domain and range are also flipped for the domain and range of the inverse function. The graph is a reflection over the line y equaling x. So that kind of gives you a foundation for what inverse functions look like, how it works with the equations, with all your ordered paired points, and what the graph looks like.